how can they get an easy ride? How can they get to where they got without even having the hardships and the hard fights and proving themselves? Mm. They're making millions doing nothing. Mm. Just get a few a few training sessions, and here we are killing ourselves for 10, 15 years, mm. not even achieving uh, or making half as much as what they're making. This episode is brought to you by My Funded FX. So welcome everyone to another Words of Wisdom podcast. We are back once again in the studio and it is my great pleasure to have with us today former IBO world champion Jawed Tusleek Kalik. <laughs> welcome brother, how are you doing? I'm good thanks and thanks for having me here. No, no, it's my pleasure, my pleasure. And I know that I was literally mentioning to you off camera there that uh, before I even started a podcast like six, seven years ago, back when I actually used to train at your gym from time to time, yeah. uh, when I wanted to do a podcast, I had you on my list to have you as a, or to ask you to be a yeah, guest. And, yeah, yeah. you know, it's uh, my I'm honor to have you with me today. I'm, I'm humbled, as they say. Yeah, that's really nice uh, that you remembered me. <laughs> no, no, always, always. Well, I'm coming back. This After the, the podcast, we're going to talk about training schedule, hopefully, because as you can tell, since then, I've packed on some pounds, which is no good. But um, normally how we like to start is we like to talk about uh, you know, how your journey, you know, how you've gotten to where you are today. So if you want to go into your journey a bit, and then we can just take it from there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I started boxing uh, near the end of leaving school, to almost turning 17, mm -hmm. a gym opened in the area. I was very sort of competitive, sporty. Went down, checked it out, and uh, just fell in love with boxing. Um, and then I started dreaming about becoming a, a champion, like, like a lot of boxers, young boxers mm -hmm. do. Um, obviously, at the time, there wasn't many Asians boxing, so it was quite tough uh, to convince my family okay. uh, to support me. Um, there was a lot of uh, problems, you know, getting that kind of support. But you know, I carried on. I carried on training. Started winning fights. I mm -hmm. uh, did really well. Won the amateur um, All England Championships, the ABAs, mm -hmm. which was very prestigious at the time. Still is, and got selected to box for England. Mm -hmm. And then Prince Nassim came on the scene. Um, he inspired me to take that step forward. I was never um, sure about be, becoming a professional because I had responsibilities. I just got married. Mm -hmm. You have the family pressures with, with, with Asian families and stuff. Um, but he inspired me. I saw him doing really well. Took that chance and thought, you know, I'll try. Went to same stable as he was. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it just went from there, you know, went really well. Never expected to achieve what I achieved. Um, a lot, um, but I worked really hard and... Uh, did get the support of my family and friends, so that all helped. Definitely, and uh, obviously, as you can see here on the table, you became IBO world champion. And as you said, you'd never saw that for yourself. You never saw yourself becoming champion or turning pro. And you didn't have the support, as you said, or you were seeking that support. And you didn't have the role model necessarily for a while until, as you say, Prince Nassim sort of came on the scene. So how was it for you then going into boxing then? Was it more of a, like a passion at the time when you first started? Yeah, I think it was more of a passion. Um, like I said, it was, I'm very competitive in everything we do. Me and mm. my brothers were all very, very competitive, as yeah. you know. And I think boxing was one of the ultimate. It's one-on-one -on -one mm. at the highest level. Mm. And, uh, you know, you try to win in everything, whether it's the circus, the runs, yeah. the sparring, the fights. And, uh, and it just appealed to me. Um, I was never really a fighter, never caused trouble. I was very shy, very quiet. And I think that helped me build my confidence okay. in, in, in years to come, you know. But before that, nobody even knew I was boxing. Mm. I'd keep it very quiet, just take my own, couple of friends that were close to me to fights. Uh, my family started coming a bit later. Mm -hmm. But everybody started finding out once I got into the papers and regularly in the papers or of the course, news yeah. and, and articles and stuff. Um, but, yeah, um, I think um, it was a bit later on that I really took it seriously. And uh, I think, like I said, you always dream, everybody dreams about it, but you never actually believe it because my confidence was never really that good yeah at, at the start and I think I built my confidence as I performed better I got I got to a higher level and uh, my coach Fidel he helped me with my confidence um he was very good with that as well um, that's good to hear and and obviously as you say like the confidence you built over time was it a case where obviously as you started to see sort of more success within the journey did your confidence just build and build yeah, I think I think it's partly the success that you get achieve, mm. but it's just the, uh, the whole process, um, going to different countries, going to different gyms, mm. um, seeing different people, hearing advice from different people. And I think it gradually you remember things and it slowly builds your confidence. Everyone's different. And 
uh, I get a lot of young kids coming to the gym with absolutely no confidence, and mm-hmm. and I talk to the parents and tell them exactly the same thing how I was and how it can help and uh, enhance and, and and build their confidence in, in general life. It doesn't have to be boxing. You don't have to be um, looking to become a boxer or anything. Just in general life and uh, mm-hmm. everyday everyday stuff. Definitely, and you know the the landscape in boxing and pretty much society as a whole was very different back then. You know there wasn't as much uh, social media, or there was no yeah, social yeah. media, should I say? And therefore, you know, nowadays a lot of people get into boxing and they can try and find some form of success from having the social media side, even if they don't have the skill set side. Well, back then, I would imagine it was more so you had to have that skill set. You know? Yeah, definitely. I think um, back in the day, I think it was more about how you box. Mm-hmm. Now it's about what, how, how much you can attract people and yeah. and how much um, likes and the rest of it you get. And you get a lot of people, um, I've seen it in my gym, I've seen it outside where they're, they're on TikTok, they're on Instagram and they're putting stuff up and they already think they've achieved and mm. they've made it there big. And, um, and yes, it does help advance you a lot quicker and it gives you that platform. But mm. um, I think um, it can work both ways where it can be bad and good. Yeah, do you think it can be like a sort of form of distraction from the actual it can, task? It can be a big distraction. It can be um, uh, a sense of being better than what you are. Mm. Uh, and they think that they've already got there. And then as soon as they get a hard fight or yeah. they realise what it's really like, you know, and, uh, and and it can all fall apart. Yeah, so do you think that's why you see some of these fighters when they have some adversity, even if they don't lose, but they just have a hard fight, as you say, that they sort of crumble for, for a long time? Yeah, definitely. I think... Um, me and my trainer, we always, uh, my old trainer, we always talking about that. I think society has become a bit more softer. Mm. I think big back in the day, things were a bit harder. If you, if you were sore, if you had an injury, if you was hurt, it was like get on with it. You know, stop being a little, uh, a, a, a softy or whatever it was. Yeah. You know, and um, nowadays it's um, a lot more, a lot, a lot more. Um, you can't, you know, you don't train like with with an injury. Don't do this. Don't do that. It's a bit more pro- overprotected. Over, I think they overprotect you in every way, mm. whether it's. The people that you're boxing, uh, whether it's just general life and just ge- in, in general, uh, I think that softens people mm-hmm. up. And um, I think in boxing you need to be mentally tough as well as physically, Definitely. more more mentally than physical. I think mm. so, like more psychological than, than yeah. obviously the physical side Definitely, of things. Because yeah. it's interesting, obviously, as I, I mentioned to you before, uh, I'm a trader. So in trading, they say the same thing, where it's ninety percent psychological, and then only a small percentage of it is actually you know the the actual movements of trading. I, I think you're very right there. I think it's very, very true. And it's similar to boxing and most sports, you know. I think, I think, so, yeah. a, I think a lot of it is 80, 90% mental and the rest is physical. Mm-hmm. If you believe, as they say, if you believe you can achieve. Mm-hmm. And that is so true. Definitely. And and so what was it like for you in your boxing gym when you were sort of training and, and building up the ranks? What was the environment like? I think it was more of a chilled environment back then. It mm-hmm. was, um, I started at the um, Port Lake Centre mm-hmm. And um, it was a new gym in the area. They had, didn't have much equipment. They had an old little chap who was um, Albert and uh, uh, rest his soul. He's passed away a few years back. And uh, and then later on, Ken Ken Bolton. He's just passed away a few um, a couple of weeks ago. So I just like to say condolences to all his family. Definitely. Yeah. And um, he helped me quite a bit. Um, but we were we were having fun. It was more fun. It wasn't really serious. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just about teaching you a bit of discipline, getting you fit, getting you healthy, and, and teaching the basics of boxing. Mm-hmm. And then those that wanted to compete, later on they started competing. Um, but with it being a, a very new club, there wasn't many boxers. So it was mm-hmm. just me and one or two of the guys that were that were boxing. So um, I think we were we were all quite 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 chilled and enjoying things there. Yeah. Definitely. And I remember you mentioning in a in a previous interview that you had quite a sweet tooth growing up. <laughs> and even to this day I'm yeah, not sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did you handle that at the time, obviously, being a boxer? Or was it something you just kind of accepted? Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I grew up having a, a, a shop. Mm. We sold sweets. And, and then later on, I was driving uh, in the taxis for a little while mm. and um, on and off. Again, you don't, you don't, you don't eat right. You, you go to different, you know, long hours. Mm-hmm. You, you stop off at a petrol station, grab a, a snack. And I was terrible for it. You know, I loved, <laughs> I loved my sweet. I loved my fizzy drinks. And uh, I was very lucky that. Over the years, I never, I never really took much time off. I was always training. I was always active. My weight was controlled. Mm. I was very lucky. I had a fast metabolism, so it didn't bother me that much. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't eat good, proper meals. But then the, the 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 nutrition side of it, nobody really helped us or told us things. We just learned through experience. Yeah. Whereas now they've got dietitians, they've got nutritionists, 
and, and strength training and everything else. We had to do everything ourselves and experience it through a good and bad. Yeah. Um, um, but I was very lucky. I, I had a lot of um, opera food, <laughs> um, the, the chapatis, the curries. Yeah. I lived off that. So, I, you know, I, I didn't really change that a lot, just cut it down slightly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the same with the sweets, I cut it down. I cut it down a little bit again, but um, it's... it's very you've kept good. training even to this day, oh, though, haven't you? I, I, I've, been, I've had injuries for the last 10, 15 years on and off, but I've kept kept myself active. I got into coaching not long after I retired, mm-hmm. so that kept me active. And, uh, yeah, I'm just still loving it. You know, I'm still trying to compete with the young lads, and, and that keeps me fit. And uh, Well, definitely. Well, the last time me and you sparred, you dropped me, I mean, <laughs> twice or three times. So I don't think oh, that I'm would sorry. change even today. I'm no, sorry. No. That must have been a lucky shot. <laughs> never, <laughs> never. I think it was only... I think it was literally only the one round we did together as well. So it wasn't even like uh, extended rounds. But yeah, it just goes to show, look, it's all about that discipline. You, you've kept that discipline through all those years and it doesn't you know, leave you. And, and as you said earlier, you're a very competitive person you yeah. know, and it stays within you. And I think, do you think that some people are just born that way, you know, just naturally competitive? Or is it something like a thought process that someone I chooses think, I think, to be? I think some people are brought up that way. Mm. I think it depends on how you are in your in your family or your upbringing. And I think mm-hmm. um, we were very competitive in our brothers. Okay. I, think, I think a lot of families, when they have a brother and someone, they're always fighting wrestling yeah. at home and you're trying to, you know, be the, the number one in the house. Mm. Um, if, you're, if you're out playing football, you want to win it. If you're out running, you want to win it. Mm. Little, thing, little things. And, and it just, we were four brothers and we were all very competitive. We love, we all loved sport. Yeah. And I think that just, yeah, that just got instilled in us. So it kind of like, it kind of grew but yeah. naturally, I at think home. it was just yeah, it was, yeah. Thank you. it was naturally through home. My dad was very strict, mm. very tough person that always wanted the best, wanted us to be the best at everything we do. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, that helped as well. Was that hard? Like as being a, a youngster, was it hard to sort of deal with not that pressure, but that sort of expectation of being the best at what you do? Or was it actually? No, could I you think, see it? I at think the time? It, I think it is always a pressure, mm-hmm. and I think um, sometimes you don't perform because of that pressure, mm. um, and you're always thinking about they're going to be upset. Yeah, Your parents are going to be upset. Your family's going to be upset or people are going to be upset. So you put extra added pressure on you. A lot of people can crumble mm. and others can th- thrive from it. And uh, I think I was one that um, sh- sh- you know, shined a bit when it came to the, to the crunch or in the fights, I performed better. Mm-hmm. I wasn't as good sometimes in sparring. I was a bit too nice. But in there, it was like, I have to win. Mm. At all costs, I have to win. Um, there was fights that I was almost close to losing, mm-hmm. um, but I somehow pulled them out. Because I had that fight in me, I had that desire, I had that pressure of like I can't go home and uh, and and face my family, face people. Yeah, and, and you know we were. I think a lot of Asians are, have got that pride where they, they they feel um like they can't they can't let people down. Definitely, no, definitely, I couldn't agree more. And you mentioned earlier about not having that support initially with the boxing. So what was that like at the time? Yeah, I think like a lot of parents, a lot of Asian parents, especially, um, they want you to study. They want mm-hmm. you to become a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant mm-hmm. or something. And it's the same for all of them. And at that time, there wasn't much. Um, there, many, there wasn't any people interested in sport. Mm-hmm. They didn't see a future in sport. They thought it was just a waste of time. You're just going to, um, you know, waste all your life and you're not going to make anything of it and mm-hmm. the rest of it. Um, and then as they saw Prince the scene coming on the scene, they see people doing well, they see him earning money. And then it starts um, giving them that little idea of maybe my son can do it or they can do it. So they, yeah. they started um, getting behind me, but um, it did take a little bit of time to convince them. And I, I think Definitely. they saw me doing well as well, winning, I was winning all my amateur fights, mm. just losing the odd one later on. Um, so that that helped as well. And do you think you showing the discipline, because a lot of people have like fancy ideas of wanting to do something outside the norm, yeah, yeah. so outside like education, for yeah. example, but then they don't have like actual discipline. Yeah, they I might think, do it for um, a month or two. That, that's that's definitely true. I think I was um, working in the evenings, working on the cabs. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to not put any pressure on anybody. I was working, mm-hmm. making sure I covered my expenses, and then I do my training on the side. Okay. A lot of people don't know this. You know, I went through a lot. I was working till three or four o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. then going for a jogs just to keep myself in shape because yeah. you're sitting around in the cab, and then having to eat right, then wake up again, train again in the daytime, mm-hmm. then go and do a few hours because I had a family as well to feed. Yeah. Um, so I was, you know, it was quite tough. And um, I think you have to be very, very disciplined and dedicated as well. Oh, definitely, always. And especially, that's just in the process. Because I feel like a lot exactly. of people think that, you know, when you get successful at something, then you can tone things down. But as someone who's gone through this process, would you say that you actually have to continue, and if anything, increase your discipline? I think you have to increase it. 
um, like they say, becoming a champion is the hard bit. Mm-hmm. Staying champion is even harder mm-hmm. in any kind of sport, you know, because everybody wants that now. Everybody wants that position. Yeah. They want to beat you. They want to take that title. So you've got all the young people coming up, all the ones that were hungry like you or the ones that really want it. So you might have trained really hard coming up today. You have that fire and that hunger. Somehow you've got to keep that going. And it's sometimes difficult. As Marvin Hagler said, it's, it's, it's hard uh, waking up with sleeping in silk sheets or something. Mm. You know? <laughs> and, um, and it's true. Mm. And as soon as you get a bit comfortable, I felt it myself a few fights later, a few fights later when I got a bit more comfortable, you start taking punishment and you start thinking about the future. Mm. Um, what am I going to do for my kids? And, you know, am I going to be taught properly? Am I going to be okay? You know, you hear all these stories. Yeah. And it does worry you a little bit and you start um, softening up a little bit. Yeah. And, and you know, have that same hunger, that same fire that you had before. Mm. And, and you need that in any kind of sport at the top level. Definitely. definitely. No, definitely. And, you know, you mentioned about uh, Prince and Seen being a role model. How important was it to have some form of role model, do you think? within your training. Before him, was there anyone else who was I think, on your I seat? think it's very important in mm-hmm. any aspect of life to have a role model. Mm-hmm. It helps you become better in yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I had role models of Sugar Ray Leonard, mm-hmm. my, um, uh, Thomas Hearns, mm-hmm. who were my weight back in the day. They were the, uh, the top buys. Uh, there wasn't much social media. There wasn't YouTube and all that. Well, YouTube was there, but you could see some of the old fights. But yeah. We didn't see a lot of old mm-hmm. fights on the new people. So they were my role models. But then seeing Prince Nassim, who was an Asian, yeah. the world, that was an added mm-hmm. bonus. Is he you know? from the Midlands as well? He was, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, he was from Sheffield. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think it's in the middle. That's your show, isn't it? I think. I mean, I think it's close, close <laughs> enough, right? Yeah, it's close, close by, enough, yeah. yeah. So, was um, it helpful, obviously, to have an yeah, Asian so who think, was also from a I similar think an area? Asian, yeah, that just changed it, you know. But, um, but I had my old role models, Muhammad Ali, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Tyson and Roberto Duran. There was a lot of role models, and mm-hmm. uh, um, they. They made me dream about becoming a world champion. I saw what they were doing. And then later on, Prince Nassim came on the scene. Mm-hmm. And he just pushed me that little bit to help me take that little step forward where I was working. I had a, I had a, I had a kid, I had my family, wife. And I thought, you know, if I give it a couple of years, maybe I could do something. I've spent all them years, mm-hmm. eight, nine years as an amateur, at the top of my game, number one in England. You know, it'd be a shame to not try. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I'll take them... T- Two, three years it'll take, see how it goes. Mm-hmm. And I was doing really well for two, three years and then I took that extra step. But Definitely. that's another thing people don't realise. Any kind of uh, process just take a few years. You don't become a boxer or a champion within three, four, five years mm-hmm. unless you're really special, something like AJ. Um, but generally it takes eight, nine, ten years before you achieve something and then another few years as a professional mm-hmm. to get even further. So it is a long process. And Because uh, you started what they would consider in boxing a bit later. Than most, right? I did, yes. A lot of people think um, 17 is quite late, which it is mm-hmm. for boxing. Boxing is, as I say, a young man's game. You have to do it pr- pretty young. Um, that's when you sort of um, do things without thinking about it because it becomes instilled in you. Yeah. And you're younger, you have time as you get later. As you get older, you get slower. Your, le- your reflexes start slowing down a little mm-hmm. bit. And boxing is all about speed and reflexes and mm-hmm. a little bit of power as well, but more about that. So, But um, as, as we said earlier, you know, I trained, I hardly had much time off. I was always in the gym, mm-hmm. proper dedicated in that sense. So I think that helped me um, get a bit further. I had a bit of talent, but I think I worked a bit harder than the others. Yeah. That helped me take that next step forward, yeah. Definitely, definitely. And then what was it like then to work with one of your role models then, for example, or someone you looked up to? So obviously you were training yeah, in the same um, gym, I was right? training in the same gym. Um, Brendan Ingle was in my corner for the first few fights. Mm-hmm. His son, Dominic, was in the fights. And uh, but Brendan gave me so much... Um, knowledge, uh, just a few words. I didn't get a lot of training from him because I was traveling up and down of course, yeah. uh, every week, mm-hmm. a few times a week. I stayed up there a few times. Um, but to hear some of the stuff that they were saying, um, pass on some of the experience, mm-hmm. seeing Prince Nassim there, I didn't do a lot of training with him, okay. but he was there in the gym. Like I said, he was in and out, usually when the gym was a bit quieter. Of course, yeah. And because uh, and he was at the top and he was close to leaving them. So after about mm-hmm. two years, I think he left them. And that's when things went a bit slower and I had to leave them afterwards mm. because I wasn't getting my chances, you know. Um, and and I was getting older, I needed to uh, move on quick. Definitely, yeah. And what is that like in terms of uh, the boxing scene of having to, you know, pivot at speed um, so that you can stay, you know, at the top or to be able to make the best decision to move yeah, forward? Yeah, I, I think boxing is all about timing. Mm-hmm. Um, getting the right fights at the right time mm-hmm. uh, makes a massive difference. Um, you know, you're having the right experience before the big fights mm-hmm. um so yeah if 
I was already, um, I think I was 29, 30-ish, 29-ish, and I was in a position for a title. I think I just won a, a little belt. And um, they weren't really doing much with me. They were f offering me fights against top names at short notice, just chucking me in as an opponent, basically. Mm. And yes, it gives you an opportunity, but it's an opportunity that you're, on paper, 80%, 90% there to lose mm -hmm. and make the numbers up. And yeah. um, boxing is political. Mm. And I started learning that a bit later on. There's a lot of things that go on there. They're not actually fixed, but they are, in a sense, in the background. Trying to, yeah. Yes. Like with like little finer details. Yes. Um, and a lot of boxers get used and abused in that way where they feel pressured. If they don't take a fight, they won't get another fight for a few months. Mm -hmm. If they don't take a fight, they don't get paid. Mm -hmm. And the, and the, the, only the top 5 or 10% get the big money. Yeah. The rest of us get very little. And um, I was in them kind of positions where I was there about... I was, I was upsetting a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I was ch getting chucked in with fights where I shouldn't have been winning, but I was winning them at the last yeah. minute. So I was on the, on the verge of getting the big names. And I thought before long, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it every time. You know, the sooner or later I'm going to get beat. Yeah. Um, you can't have, you need a bit of luck and I can't have that luck every time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided to move and change management, which kind of promised me. There were, it was um, Eddie, Eddie, well, Eddie Hearn's father, but, um, Barry Hearn, yeah. he was working with Tommy Gilmore, mm -hmm. or, or my manager Tommy Gilmore, but from Scotland. Somebody introduced me to him. Okay. And uh, and he promised to get me a couple of chances, mm -hmm. uh, which he did. He, you know, he'd he done really well. Problem is, he was in Scotland. So okay. it was a little bit far away to help promote me here. Of course, yeah. Um, but uh, he'd done really well with what, what, what we had and mm -hmm. the time that we had. And I got my chance for the IBO title not long after I moved with him. Mm -hmm. Got the Commonwealth title first, and then straight into the IBO title, and then... Defended it seven times. Uh, yeah, you did. You know, a lot of people didn't expect me to um, achieve that much. Mm -hmm. um, being so well starting, but very late, not getting the um, backing that I could have got or should yeah. have got. Mm -hmm. uh, being a former amateur champion, but um, I think people probably didn't want to take the risk because I was a bit older, so they didn't see okay. um, their investment get back coming back to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I done uh, I done quite well, so I'm quite proud of myself. Oh and, no, definitely. Uh, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy with. Uh, obviously, no. Everybody wants more. You yeah. know, I feel like I could have had one or two more fights. I uh, retired as champion. I should have had a, a couple of fights in America. Mm. They didn't develop. I kept getting told I was going to have it. Then it got cancelled. Then it have it got cancelled. And then I had a year and a half, year and a half, almost without a fight. Yeah. And if you're not earning, sorry, if you're not fighting, you're not earning. Of course. I had two or three kids by that time, mm -hmm. and I needed to decide what I was going to do with my life. Yeah. And I thought, you know what? I don't mind getting. Um, short notice fights or fights that I, 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 I'm getting thrown in against the young up and coming fighters mm -hmm. as long as I get paid right and I get looked after in a sense mm -hmm. but that wasn't happening and I wasn't scared to fight anybody it was just um, the right fights weren't getting made it wasn't motivating enough yeah and then it? I was starting to lose the hunger mm -hmm. and and I was thinking about the futures and stuff and uh, you know I decided to retire as champion not get used like some of the other of fighters mm -hmm. um, I kind of regret it I kind of thought think I should have Tried a bit harder to get with some of the bigger names, yeah. Um, but I think at that time boxing was a little bit. It, it was um, it was struggling a little bit. You know, there's only Sky it's Sports. Like a little bit of a low period. Yeah, it was a bit of a low period. Because was it, it after wasn't. by that time with Prince Nassim retired and, and yes. still finished? Yeah, yeah, all that retired. He'd retired a few years, I think. Mm -hmm. And the boxing was a bit low. There wasn't the money available. Mm. About three or four, five years maybe after I retired, mm -hmm. Eddie Hearn came on the scene, changed the whole mm -hmm. you know concept of boxing. And just killed it. And uh, had I been around now, it'd have been totally different. But of course, you know, yeah. everybody's got their time, and uh, mm. we've got to be happy with our time and and, and how it's written, as we say. So yeah. you know, um, I think if you don't, you'll be bitter and you'll be you get depressed in a sense, and think about that for the rest of your life. You know, definitely. Um, yeah. So I just got to look forward now. Hundred percent. So like the IBO title that you held, uh, Floyd Mayweather held it after you. Yeah, yeah. So how does yeah. that feel then sort of being a part of this lineage? Because Roger Mayweather had it before yeah, you as well. That's, that's another claim to fame, as I said, as, mm -hmm. as a few people have said to me. Um, Floyd Medler took my belt after I retired. Mm -hmm. um, the IBA was a little bit of a newer version of the okay. world titles. Mm -hmm. um, some people sort of put it as one of, one of the lower versions of it, but mm -hmm. they're all world titles and it's all about it's all politics and it's all about money making for the yeah, organizations and yeah. stuff. Now it's regarded as one of the decent belts. A lot of the big names have had this belt. Mm -hmm. Lennox Lewis, Floyd Mayweather, a few others. 
uh, I think Roy Jones and a few others have had it. So mm-hmm. it's 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 built up and it's got quite a big good reputation. That's it. Well, AJ was I think it was the first belt AJ yeah, guy as well. AJ has got it as mm-hmm. well. So you know, I'm proud of what I've got achieved, and people can say what they like, but um, I think um, you have to look at what you've done and who you boxed and stuff, and oh, that, yeah. you know that could sort of gives you a bit of recognition as well. Oh, 100 percent. And you know, was part of that, you know, politics and and them trying to put you into last minute fights and put you in and try to not essentially set you up to lose, but have a higher chance of losing yeah, because yeah. of last minute. Was that something that kind of gave you the fire uh, to kind of when you did take these fights? To, to make sure you won. Oh, definitely. You know, like with the, um, uh, as I said, you know, we're a, we're a very proud race mm-hmm. and um, uh, I was very competitive. I don't like losing mm-hmm. or anything. And um, when when the, when you think you're being used, mm-hmm. you're being um, pushed and forced into something that you don't really want to do. Yeah. And you want to prove people wrong, definitely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was always very, very competitive in that sense. And, um, and it, and it made it even more mm-hmm. um, more of a challenge mm-hmm. to prove the people wrong, the promoters, the people course, that yeah. are, are behind the scenes. And uh, and yeah, it was a really good feeling. And then when I done it once, twice, three times, four, yeah. it just made it even more <laughs> um, satisfying. And I wanted to do carry on doing that and prove people wrong. I and can luckily, imagine. Yeah, you know, I, I, most of the time I did. That's it. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And you know, a lot of people maybe going through sort of that experience. Uh, they could either have two choices, of course. One, to let it kind of push them out and be like, okay, I don't want to be part of this or yeah. make them second guess their their choices. Or as you've done, obviously, on the other side, how did you make that sort of choice? Would, did, did those thoughts ever come into mind? Let's take a break for a minute there, guys, because I want to introduce you to our sponsor, My Funded FX. Now, just as I'm taking over the podcast space, they're taking over the prop firm space. Now, you can trade up to 300K with My Funded FX. They have no maximum trading days no maximum trading days it's insane i know you have to achieve eight percent in the challenge five percent in the verification and you have no time restraints you can do that in one month six months however long it takes you it's crazy i know but also on top of that there's only one minimum trading day so you can get fully funded within two days two days it's insane i'm blowing your minds right now i know but they are taking over the prop firm space now they have a two-step challenge and verification and they also have a one step make sure you use the code riz in the affiliate code section, so they know that I sent you. The link is in the description. But let's get back to the episode. I think I think you have all these negative thoughts. Definitely, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, at the beginning, I wasn't the most confident, like I said. Yeah. And there was nerves, but I was quite good at, uh, at hiding the nerves. You know, I was a good poker face. Yeah. And I think deep down, I think most boxers are nervous. Mm-hmm. Um, but some people use it as fire and mm-hmm. and, and, and 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 make them better. Mm-hmm. Um, I think as boxers, you're proud. You don't want to say no to any kind of mm-hmm. fight. And you go there even though you know there's a chance you're going to lose or get knocked out. And I think yeah. a lot of these fighters do that. Um, some of us have that ability. I think I must have had a bit of an ability, a bit of a punch or something mm-hmm. that took me to that next stage um, and got me through them fights. Yeah. A lot of fighters, unfortunately, haven't got that ability or mm-hmm. they haven't had that. They, they aren't being as dedicated, as disciplined to prepare, mm-hmm. uh, be prepared. I wasn't prepared for these fights, but I was always in the gym, so it helped me stay reasonably fit. Maybe that's why, you know, I was in a better position or was able to mm-hmm. cause them upsets. There's a lot of fighters that do cause upsets, mm-hmm. but not as many as I did. I yeah, no, 100%. Think, you know, I, I saw back uh, to back. Yeah, so it was back to back. So mm-hmm. um, there was definitely a bit of an ability and, 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 and obviously me being quite dedicated, mm-hmm. quite strict in what I was doing. I think that all helped and it all came together, definitely. Definitely. And with the IBO title fight, was that a last minute fight as well? No, the, that was, um, I think I got four four to five weeks notice, okay. not as much as a lot of people do. Mm. Um, but he was, bo- I think Willie Wise was the American that came over with the belt. Yeah. He boxed um, somebody in London, I can't remember his name now. And they said, whatever happens, we're going to try to get you in to win because the other fighter was, um, our, our, he was in our oh, stable. I think, okay, yeah? okay. So they said, you'll get, you'll get a fight with the winner, hopefully. Mm-hmm. And uh, they won't take, I, don't, I think they were expecting the Londoner to win. Okay. The American will cause an upset. Willie Wise won the fight because mm-hmm. he was a youngster my size and and he was doing quite well. And uh, he won it. And then they said, you know, we've we'll got you in position. Don't worry, you're going to get the fight. Okay. And uh, put my name forward and uh, and uh, and it went from there. Yeah, I think I got four. That was probably the longest um, time I had to prepare. Because you've had like the shorter times. Yeah. So when you had that time, did that almost feel like a full camp? It was like a camp for me, you know, because yeah. I've never had a proper camp before. I had mm. a couple of small 
kind of training uh, camps in a sense. But then there wasn't many camps to be mm. honest. And uh, and the things that we practice went went all was almost perfect in the fight. You know, everything went to plan. Yeah, I made the fight a lot easier than it could have or should have been. Mm-hmm. You know, my jab was beautiful, my movement was good, and uh, and, it, and it just seemed like an easy fight, other than me sort of breaking my hand. You know, oh, cool. um, uh, and not being able to finish him won it quite comfortably. Um, mm-hmm. A one-sided in, in a twelve-round fight. Definitely, I think you dropped him, didn't you? And hurt I dropped him. A few him. Times. That's when I hurt my hand. Yeah, dropped yeah. him, and then after that, I was just touching him with it just to keep him thinking it's okay. But um, yeah, we weren't able to hit him hard enough to to mm. hurt him. But he was tough, and he was game, and he kept coming. How do you handle that sort of adversity? Because with trading, for example, and any high performance sport, the secret to success, if you will, is being able to handle the the pressure, right? To be calm under yeah, that yeah, pressure, yeah, yeah. and. Um, how do you do that then? How do you handle sort of you know, being in front of a crowd, breaking your hand in the middle of a fight, but staying calm and yeah, sticking yeah, yeah. to a game plan? How did as you do I, that? I think um, as an amateur, I, I I boxed in quite big uh, arenas or crowds. Mm-hmm. Um, when once I went for the ABAs, I had done that tournament. I went to away to America. Uh, sorry, I, I went abroad mm-hmm. a few times for England, and uh, I think that all helped. Um, as I when I turned professional, I started getting my confidence a little better. Um, the pressures were always there, but I'd always tell myself I've, I've put the I've put the time in training. I, I, I um, treat it like a spa. Everything that you've done, you're going to do it here. And mm-hmm. as much as you tell yourself, you still have them butterflies, them nerves of not of not um, doing what you want to do. Of course, you know, letting people down again. And it come, it, it always used to come back to that for me. Mm. Um, everybody has their own way, I think, of dealing with these situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think you just it's all about confidence. And believing in yourself and knowing what you've done, in, uh, preparing. Yeah, in the preparation uh, has, has been right. You know, if you've mm-hmm. slacked in your preparation, that's going to really affect it in a big way. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not mentally strong enough, that can affect it. Mm-hmm. Um, as, but but I think uh, I think um, a lot of people do get affected when people are watching and there's a big crowd. Of course, and others are the opposite. You know, mm. and they thrive on it mm. and, and it helps. And I think I started um, enjoying the tension. Mm-hmm. I started enjoying being in the in the in the in the, in the center, all the crowd there, the the, mm-hmm. the, the noise, um, and it, and it and it helped me take to help take me to another level. I think. Yeah, did was it almost as if like it just put you into a different state of mind when inside yeah, think, that ring? Um, I've told people a lot of times that you you're getting to you know once you get into the arena, you hear all the noise, mm-hmm. you get into the ring, everything blacks out. You hear a little bit of a noise, you hear this the certain people that you can. That you listen to, like your trainer, my brother, a couple mm. of other people that used to um, shout. I could hear them through the whole oh, wow. of that crowd, and the re- and the lights were still there, but the mm. the ring in itself was like all all quiet, and uh, and it's just me and him. Mm. And, and 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 sometimes you can see everything coming and uh, and be prepared in a sense, you know, not yeah. slow motion, but in a sense a bit like a slow motion movie. And yeah, and, and uh, do you think that comes down to that? As you said, like that preparation. Yeah, that oh, definitely, time. definitely. I think the more. The Would more, you ever have like a process of like you know sort of envisioning how you want the fight to go? I, th- I think a lot of the time I used to do that. Yes, mm. um, it never actually goes the way you plan. <laughs> yeah. Um, because they've got their ideas of what they want to do. Mm. Um, but there's certain things that work out similar, and it helps in a big way. Yeah. Yeah. And and sometimes I'd prepare myself for adversity or mm. a cut or a hand and think. If this happens, how am I going to deal with it? Okay. So I was already in, had that mindset, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then it, it helped. What it did actually happen, you know, um, I moved and, and boxed and kept him away. Or mm-hmm. if I if the hand was hurting, I'd move her and use the other hand, and or switch stance and use the other hand. So yeah. um, we had a few little uh, plans, and luckily each time it kind of helped and worked out okay. Definitely. So it's kind of like just preparing for any scenario. Yeah, I think yeah. I think it's all preparing for each scenario. Being aware of all the situations that can arise, mm-hmm. um, and and more more so, I think it's all in your mind again. Back to that where we said earlier, yeah, being mentally strong. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think um, near the end, I started getting quite mentally strong, mm-hmm. where I believed in myself. Um, I believed any situation happens, I can deal with it. Mm-hmm. And um, and 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 you know, I had a broken rib once. I dealt with it, wow. and it was painful. Mm. And it's just hard to explain to people how. You can deal with them kind of situations, you know, broken hand. Uh, but when you have that kind of mindset and um, 
and don't allow it to bother you as much. Mm-hmm. You block things out. The pain is there, but you can deal with it in in in, in a funny way, mm. and 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 in some way find find a way to get away with it. You know, definitely. Well, when you box at that high level in any sort of high performance sport, you have to be a, be willing to obviously put in more pain and and endure more pain and to put in more work than the majority of people do in their lifetime. And, you know, I, I like to talk about the Marines a lot, for example, because they go through their challenges to train as a Marine. They put themselves through the worst kind of things, but mm-hmm. to build a different type of being, right? A different type of mindset. That's, that's so true. And, you know, with yourself, obviously, what sort of advice or, or can you speak on, should I say, that, you know, going through all that training, that hardship, like how have you realized that you can actually handle pain? You know, like most people might hear, yeah, it, oh, think, you broke your hand, how I can think, you even I use think, it? I think everybody is different. Some people mm. could never deal with anything. Mm. They think, oh, these people are crazy. You know, there's something wrong with them. Yeah. And I think in any kind of sport or any kind of thing you do in life, you have to be a little bit crazy. And mm. it's all about how much passion you have for that activity, that sport, that whatever you love. Yeah. If you love it, if you... um if you're passionate about it, mm-hmm. I think that helps in a big way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think you, uh, in time, as you keep preparing, as you um, get more experience in whatever you're doing, mm-hmm. I think that helps in a big way as well. Um, and and you learn to deal with whatever situation comes. Yeah. Um, again, we we'll come back to it's all, it's all about believing in yourself, believing in what you're doing, what you're thinking is right. Mm-hmm. That helps in a in a big way. Prepare preparation in anything you're doing. Again. That builds your confidence, and then it comes back to them two, three, three things: confidence, believing in yourself, mm. and uh, and preparing right. So all that starts within. That all starts within, mm-hmm. and uh, having the right people around you. Sorry, as well, yeah. having the right people around you, because if you've got the right people supporting you, the right people there when you need them, mm-hmm. that's a massive thing, because you're always gonna have ups and downs. When you're down mm-hmm. and there's nobody there for you, it's the worst feeling. Mm-hmm. When when you're down, you have somebody there. Just put a uh, an arm around your shoulder, hold mm-hmm. your hand, just tell you it's going to be okay. Little things, mm-hmm. little things um, that can be priceless. That's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. You know, that can really lift you, um, keep you, keep you, keep you um, positive. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, there's so many boxers I've seen because I'm in boxing. Obviously, I relate to that. Um, that have had a bad experience and mm-hmm. they've quit. Mm-hmm. It's so easy to quit, but it's very hard to carry on doing what you're doing mm-hmm. and and get to where you want to get to. You know, no road is going to be easy in life. Every road, you're going to have a stumbling block. You're going to have something that's going to um, make it hard for you. Something that's going to, you have to overcome in some way. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they're the people that uh, can make something in their life, you know. Definitely. Uh, And again, it has to be coming from you within. It has to come in within. Definitely. The belief, the support, Mm -hmm. um, everything, yeah. And do you know, like, when it comes to what you've done in boxing, and I think it translates to the trading side and translates to pretty much every anything else that you want to be successful at. <clears throat> Obviously, before the, say, let's say the amateur rounds, the actual fights, right, the amateurs and the professional, that's, let's say, off the top of my head, I'm just guessing, like 200 rounds, let's say, right, maybe 300 rounds. But then I'm guessing in the gym, right, and in sparring and et cetera, you've probably done thousands of miles, thousands of rounds yeah, yeah. in preparation. What can you say in terms of the amount of preparation that goes into just those smaller numbers you know, of the actual fighting, the actual? You yeah, know? I think I think a lot of people don't see mm-hmm. a lot of that or understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was an amateur for nine, ten years, on and off. Mm-hmm. I had a couple of years off here and there, and you forget about all the rounds you've done in the actual training. Yeah, and <clears throat> and like you said, when you think about it, it's going to be in the thousands, mm-hmm. not the hundreds, probably the thousands, and sometimes. If you're doing it wrong, you can take more punishment. Yeah. That can cause more problems and, and shorten your career. Yeah. If you're clever, you do things correctly and you learn from the training side of things. There's no point in fighting every day and like a fight mm-hmm. because that's where the damage occurs. And and the, what you practice becomes second nature. That's what you want to do. You want to be rep- repeat everything so, religiously so it becomes second nature. Mm-hmm. So when you go into a fight, you're doing the, all the moves without even thinking about it. Yeah. That's what we tell people all the time and you've got to do it almost every day, you know, every day. If you want to achieve something, you've got to be doing it regularly. The same, people think it's boring, but the same basic stuff is what you've got to be doing for the first few years mm. to make it second nature. It's like building a strong foundation. It's all about building that strong foundation. If you've got a strong foundation, you build on top and you become better and better and then 
nothing crumbles easily. That's it, yeah. And, you know, you have the nickname Too Sleek. Where did, where did that come from? What was um, that? Yeah, we had um, a couple of boxers, Jason Booth, Nicky Booth. Mm -hmm. um, Nicky passed away again a few years ago. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I think, God rest his soul as well. Really nice kid. Mm -hmm. um, we had a few problems. But them two had nicknames, two smooth booths and one smooth. <laughs> and I used to train. Well, when I left the Ingalls, I went yeah. down to uh, another gym in um, Junction 28. Uh, it was uh, Jason Chinfield. Mm -hmm. And um, we started training there. And, I, and a lot of them struggled to hit me. Mm -hmm. I'd, be, I'd be moving really smoothly and relaxed. And they go, he's too sleek, he's too sleek. And then I just it just clicked, you know, too sleek, Kalik. Yeah. And it was my name, and I said, you know what? That's actually a good name because I didn't really like some of the, the gimmicky names, and I was always mm. a bit of a simple person. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, you know what? I won't mind that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So we just, it just, you know, almost, almost then brothers almost made it, you know, or, yeah. or people from the gym sort of said it, and um, it. and it stuck. And yeah, it's crazy because I've recently had a few people shouting me out, you know, um, in the cars, you know, saying, oh, too sleek, too sleek. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, we could. They still remember that name. That's it. I think I'm sure they will because obviously I know in Nottingham your name's always been known. Like I remember growing up and uh, you know first coming across your boxing gym, uh, you know it was Jared Kalik, you know IPO former world champion. I remember first going. I think I was maybe 14 or 15 when I first went to your right. so over yeah. probably like 13 years ago now. Yeah. You know, and then I was on. I came for a period. <coughs> was off. Came for a period. Was off. Uh, I've always loved the the, the vibe that you've brought to the gym because it's real as we talked about earlier you know nowadays it's a lot softer yeah. you know society is a lot softer and it's, it probably even compared to 13 years ago to now it's even worse yeah yeah um so how do, how do you sort of sort of bring a sort of to, sort of vibe to the gym i think i think we're, we're, people have got to understand we're not we're not really hard hard in the gym mm. what we're teaching me and my old trainer um we sort of teach a bit of discipline general life discipline yeah i think that's what's missing with kids nowadays and and generally, and that that sort of makes them softer in other areas as mm -hmm. well. And boxing, you need to be tough mentally, physically. Like I said, otherwise it can be quite hurtful and painful, you know. Yeah. And it can put you off, and a lot of people will will leave. Um. So we sort of try to instill a little bit of discipline in them, as well as toughen them up. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of families, and it's just general. Like uh, I think the countries or the world has just changed, and 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 everyone's getting softer. Mm -hmm. And you can't say certain things. You can't do certain things like it used to be. You know, schools can't discipline you. So the kids are, are, are a bit crazy and wild sometimes. So mm -hmm. they need that little bit of grounding and that little bit of discipline. Definitely. And I think it helps them in a massive way. You know, and I get a lot of kids, a lot of parents, sorry, coming to me saying, oh, they've changed. It's helped their schoolwork. It's, it's helping them respect us a bit more at home. It's mm -hmm. helping them be better people outside. Um, so not just boxing. I think generally, you know, the discipline that we instilled is, is helping. Definitely. No, definitely. And uh, we've seen, I've, well, I've seen it from just attending your gym, for example, and experiencing it myself. And I know that you've done a lot of work uh, with the communities. I remember there was a initiative you started, I think, was it just before lockdown? Just before COVID lockdown? Um, it was, uh, was it Knives Down, Gloves Up. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And uh, how's that been an experience for you? Is that something that's been a passion of yours, you know, to yeah, be able well, to impact um, the community? I, I, was, I was quite lucky that I got into coaching um, very soon after I retired. Mm. So I've been doing it for about 18, 19 years now. Yeah. And we've, been, we've had a lot of struggles. We've, we've moved from one gym to another gym Yeah. because um, the, the the buildings weren't appropriate or the rent was too high. Mm. And, and people don't realise boxing gyms don't make a lot of money. Yeah. We put a lot of time in because we're passionate. We love the sport. Mm -hmm. We love giving back. And we don't get a lot of help from the government. We don't get help, a lot of help from any, anywhere else. Mm. And only recently, a few couple of years, we've had a few more people helping me and get, get on board. We've started a, another organization uh, and we've got power up at a charity, sorry. Incredible. Um, we're mm -hmm. going to be working with mental health. We're going to be working in the area, um, mentoring people. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be working with jobs, um, giving back to the community, getting the kids off the streets, helping them with boxing, Definitely. other sports as well. It's not just boxing. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, I've always been passionate. I've been very passionate about um, boxing about the kids, giving back to the kids, mm -hmm. seeing the kids outside. I've got four kids of my own, mm -hmm. and I see the things that are going on nowadays with the knife crimes and stuff. Another one that I was working with was Knives Down, Gloves Up. Um, that's on the background at the moment because mm -hmm. things we've got too much things that we've been doing. Yeah. Um, but um, we're, we're starting again with Power Up. 
uh, and the Jared Kelly Boxing Academy working together. Uh, we're going to be working with the refugee forum that we're working at the at the centre that we're at. Mm. So we've got a lot of plans now because we need to um, outreach and get out there a bit more because we've done a lot of work, but we haven't got the recognition. Um, our rent at the building that we're up at went up four or five times what we were paying. Yeah, uh, we were almost about to leave and close the gym. It got that bad. I was the last eight nine months have been so bad. Yeah, um, I've been paying four times the amount of rent that I've been I was paying. Uh, and we're just about in the process of taking on the building with the other organisation that was um, there. So we're going to have to see how that goes for the next year and then decide if we want to stay there or not. Of course. So because of that reason, we are doing a lot more so that we can um, bring a bit more money in to keep the, to keep the gym going. Yeah. Um, so we're looking for sponsorships if anybody's interested. Sorry, I'll no, definitely. just shout that out if that's okay. No, 100%. Um, we're looking for sponsorship for the gym because uh, we need help to keep the gym Mm -hmm. going so if anybody's out there any companies want their logo in the gym uh want to be part of this and helping the community helping the kids um be really appreciated just get in touch with me at any time mm -hmm. no 100 percent. Yeah, because obviously like i said there's so much great community work that goes on and i think a lot of it's down to like your passion for the actual you know sport and to be able to help build discipline in in these kids and, and change their mm -hmm. lives around I think um lot, sorry i think a lot of kids haven't got a lot of people to look up to yeah. Especially like we said earlier in our Asian community. Of course. And I think me being an ex-boxer, a, a champion mm -hmm. in this area, I think a lot of kids look up to me mm -hmm. and, and 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 it helps them get away from some of the bad stuff. Definitely. Helps them get involved in the boxing. Even if they don't want to be boxers, it helps them become better people. Mm. Um, gives them, helps, them te helps teach them that respect, yeah. discipline that boxing does instill in people. Um, so there's a lot of benefits of it. It doesn't mean you have to become a boxer. 100%. You know, um, mm -hmm. Yes, I instill discipline and I'm a little bit loud sometimes in the gym. Um, some parents and, and kids get a bit worried and scared, but it's all <laughs> beneficial later on. So, of course. Um, yeah. Well, it's like we talked about, like, you know, at the end of the day, they, there's a saying where they say, like, weak men creates, uh, weak men creates uh, hard times, right? But then uh, strong men create easy times. And it's just like a cycle that goes over and over. And right now, we have a lot more, unfortunately, like more fragile people because they're not experiencing much adversity yeah, or hardship. That, I think that's so true. We we talk about this so often, me and my, mm. my other coach and a few other people, and it's true. I think times have just changed so much. Um, everything is given to people nowadays. Yeah. Um, with all the social media, we just sit there watching other people um, and we want what they've got. We want the success without the hard work, yeah. without putting the time in and and think it's going to be given to us and it's not and, mm -hmm. and then we complain about we haven't got this and we haven't got that why because we're not doing it we're not doing anything for it yeah and uh, and the same with the, some of the boxers they see some of the top pros on social media on the on on, on the facebook instagrams and the tiktoks and they say we want to be like that they copy that and they think it takes two or three months two years to get there when it's a long process yeah. and and there's a lot of hard work involved a lot of ups and downs and uh, and i think sometimes Hardship is good. It mm -hmm. teaches you um, a lot more than just success. Definitely. Like, I bet if you were to reflect on your journey, it's probably the harder times, if anything, that probably you remember or stick out to you much more. I've always said um, the, the one fight I lost in the pros, mm. I went to France on a short notice fight against the French champion, and it was my first eight-rounder. Had I not had that fight, I probably never would have become a champion. Mm. That taught me a lot more than some of the wins taught me. Mm. So... In one sense, I was not happy, but but it was a good thing that I lost earlier. Um, it taught me a lot more about what I need to work on. Yeah, it built me. It built that confidence in me. Built that um, belief in me that mm -hmm. I can achieve and I can do better than what I think I can do. Definitely, and uh, you know now I know there's a big culture of not losing your zero right, your lost record. I know Floyd has kind of put that. As like I, a yeah, yeah. forefront, right? I know in MMA it's not really as much of a big thing, but in boxing it is. But back then, was it a sort of a big thing? I think thing it's always well? been a bit of a thing, mm. and not so much back then. Mm. Um, but it started not long after that. I think. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we we yeah they, they 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 love protecting the home fight. They love building that record up. I mean, it's a way of selling. Yeah, it is a way of selling. But if you're like the UFC and others have showed, if you're putting competitive fights on, mm -hmm. it will still sell. Yeah. And now with social media and everything, it sells even more. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world if you lose a fight. Um, sometimes it makes a fight. There's been a lot of fights that people have lost, but they become a name because they put up a really good performance. People respected them more because of that. Mm -hmm. And I think boxing is a little bit behind because of, uh, on that scale, yes. 
Um, there's too many protected boxers. Yeah. Too many promoters wanted to keep just keep on um, winning, yeah. making the money, and not risking. And uh, and it's not good. It's not good for boxing. It's not good for the the fighters. And it's not good for the young generation that look at look at them and, yeah. and see what's happening. Yeah. See, like just all the politics and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in terms of obviously, you mentioned about when you retired, you then went into uh, teaching and and coaching and, and mentoring, if you will. Uh, what was the the process of doing that? Were people requesting it from you, or was it was something that you kind of wanted to do as well? Yeah, it's something I always thought after boxing, I wanna um, I wanna coach. Mm. I didn't know what else I was gonna do. You know, I didn't really study that much in in, in school. I done a bit with plumbing and building with my dad. He was a builder and plumber, but it was not something I loved. Mm. Um, before that, I was cabin, so I was doing my own thing. Um, and uh, near the end of just before I retired, a lot of my, some of the parents that were my friends and people that used to come and support me used to say, oh, why don't you coach my kids? And why don't you coach my kids? And I started getting offers from the council as well, mm. people that knew me, saying, oh, would you like to do some classes in this centre and this centre? So I started doing freelance classes. I hired a hall, started doing some classes with no equipment. Mm -hmm. And I was getting 30 kids there. Um, and then I brought a bit of equipment myself, started kick coaching there. I wasn't making anything. I was just covering the rent and stuff, yeah. but it was a passion. Mm -hmm. And even my family and my brother were saying, what are you doing? you got kids. You, you know, you're putting all this time into there. And I yeah. go, it's just something I love and I'm happy. Mm -hmm. It's not all about money. Uh, but that's something people don't realise. You know, some things you have to be, something, sometimes money can't fulfil um, that, that happiness, that desire, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, then a couple of years later, a friend of mine in the council said there's a building um, available if you want and it was perfect. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of a, a bit of work to be done, but we we, 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 we worked on it and uh, we got that. But then that, that we lost that after two years and went and moved to another building. Yeah. Uh, but it was just, um, yeah, it just, it just, it just, it just developed from there. It just developed from there and it, it really went has, really yeah. well, yeah. It really has. And uh, like you said, in terms of passion, you know, I think a lot of people don't put a lot of focus on passion. I think a lot of people see, as you talked about earlier, and we talked about, especially in boxing, is they see the people on social media, um, you know, the boxers nowadays on social media, they see the lifestyle that they can seem to build uh, relatively quickly because they don't yes. see the behind the scenes. Um, and the same with like even in the trading space, for example, they see the money or they see the lifestyle or just any other business. And that's what they focus on, the money or the success, rather than how is that attained or do I actually enjoy that? So like with boxers, that's people right. might get into it thinking, oh, I want to be able to do this uh, you know, amazing lifestyle and build all this fame, when the reality is they're not actually passionate about boxing. And do you think anyone who is not passionate, say, about boxing or, or yeah, about the fight game, uh, would they be able to handle the adversity and the struggle that comes with it? I think I think that's the problem. Sometimes when you're not as passionate, mm -hmm. you're not, um, you don't want to, you don't want it as much as you think you want it. Mm -hmm. I think as soon as it gets hard, you'll quit easier, you'll give up quicker, uh, and, and that hap I've seen that happen so many times, where. They look, they look really good. Yeah, everybody's telling them all the right things. They see the a bit of sponsorship, or they get a bit of money and a bit of recognition through social media now. And then, as soon as they get a hard fight, that's it. And then they realize, oh my gosh, this is not what I expected. Mm. Uh, and then you don't see them again, or you, and that's happened quite a few times. Yes. Um, so I think people need to understand exactly what they get themselves into. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think you know this kind of a podcast or people, you know. Uh, can listen to other people that have had that experience mm. and it helps uh, well I think still people need to experience it until you experience it it's still quite difficult yeah very true yeah no I think uh, experience is the king in terms of like people won't understand you know mm. the whole essence of the podcast is so that people can learn about the journeys so even though like a lot of the yeah. audience at this point are probably more trading related they'll be able to recognize the traits of success you know oh, and yeah, yeah. more importantly the hardships and facing adversity and uh, putting in those you know, the work mm -hmm. to be able to move forward and to be able to progress and especially in trading for example that overlaps with boxing in particular that I really like <laughs> is the the components of the defense and offense mm -hmm. you know so like to be a great boxer I imagine it's not just about attacking a lot of people think it's just about the knockout the punch when in reality and I know you instill this a lot in your gym as well is is the defense that's right uh, and what do you think to that in terms of how how good it can your offense be if your defense is bad um, I think um, a lot of people, like you said, do not understand that. You know, anybody can throw a punch and try to hit somebody. Mm -hmm. In boxing, um, it's very difficult to hit people if they're good at moving. Mm -hmm. And 
and avoiding a shot. And that's what I tell a lot of people: if you can avoid a shot, you won't get beat. You could, you won't get you you won't get hurt. Mm -hmm. If if you want a long career, you need to be able to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. You need to take as least punishment as possible and come out of the fight game with your um, senses intact. In yeah. Sense. So is it like your your uh, risk management, if you will? Yeah. So what I, what we try to teach is a lot of footwork at the beginning, mm -hmm. a lot of defense, blocking, slipping, uh, and not getting hurt, not getting hit, uh, and that can help your offen offense because. If you can't get hit, then you can go and attack them. Mm. It makes it a lot easier, and you become a better boxer. Um, but a lot of people, like we, we, you know, they just want to hit somebody, yeah. and they think that it's very easy to knock somebody out, or you can go and hurt them that way quicker. Um, but it's not as easy as the, as it looks. You have to actually experience it to understand it. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you mentioned earlier, it's like a lot of your earlier fights, they were finishing quite early, weren't they? And it was a a lot of people were assuming that you won't be able to handle the longer rounds. Mm -hmm. But then as you experienced those longer rounds, was it a lesson in itself to build endurance to be able to, you know, how to navigate a longer fight rather than, say, a shorter one? Yeah, I think um, um, at the beginning you have shorter rounds anyway. Mm -hmm. So the fight's faster. Yeah. yeah. So when you got a, you start with a four-round, six-round or eight-round fight, mm -hmm. and, and they're faster. So um, and, and, and most of them are contenders, so they all come in to prove themselves, yeah. so they attack a bit faster. Mm. It's a bit wild. They're not as technical as later on in 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 the fights. Mm. Um, but as you get the experience and you get to the longer fights, the fights slow down, so it becomes more technical. Mm -hmm. I think for somebody like myself, who's a more of a thinking boxer, yeah. that suits me. Mm -hmm. So my fitness was always pretty good anyway. Then it's just about believing and learning. It's like when you've done something once, once mm -hmm. you've completed eight rounds, you know you can do it. Once you know. That's that's part of the confidence and belief. Then you know you can do it again, regardless of how fast it is or how slow it is. Mm -hmm. You know you've done the eight rounds. So even when it gets hard, you think I've done it before. I can do it again. Yeah. The same with the twelve. Once I've done the the first twelve was quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Around 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 eight eight nine ten, your mind starts giving up. It's like oh my god, I got oh sorry seven eight round round seven eight. It was. I felt like I couldn't go any further. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh my god, I've got another four rounds, five rounds left. But then you get that second win, mm. and, and people don't understand what the second win is. It's, you just once you're fit, you get this second win where you just feel like all of a sudden you got all your energy back, mm. and and even better, you're better than you was at the beginning of the uh, fight. Mm. You that think it's like kind of going into that flow that you mentioned yeah, earlier? Yeah, you can you can get that for two three rounds, or it can last for the next three four five rounds. Mm. And and I just felt that kicked in, and that was it. You know, the twelve rounds felt easier, and then after that. I don't know about seven other twelve rounders, and each one was as easy as the next, yeah. um, because more mental. Because I knew I've done it before. Okay. And then the preparations were easier because I know how to prepare. Okay. Um, and, and 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 doing it in the gym with with the partners you have. Mm. Uh, usually we have like two or three sparring partners. Yeah. So one might come in for three rounds, then the next one for three rounds. So you, little things like that, you know, believe, you know, I've just sparred three guys, mm -hmm. one fresh one after the other. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, I've been beating them or I've been doing well against them. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's all about confidence again. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, as part of your journey, you've had, I literally watched an interview on the way here and I didn't even realize this, but you had the key to Nottingham presented <laughs> to you by the mayor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah how, was, how did that feel, you know, because obviously yeah, Nottingham is uh, quite a small place, like especially in the Asian community, everyone kind of knows each other, but yeah, generally yeah, yeah. even in Nottingham is quite a small place, so a lot of people would have known who you were. A lot of your fights were at the at the time, the Harvey Haddon uh, Arena yeah, as well, yeah, yeah. and you were selling that out. I saw a lot of videos, obviously Full House. Uh, so what was that like, obviously, having that recognition from the city? It was it was um, unbelievable, you know. It was a bit of a shock as well. It was, mm -hmm. um, I got, I got, uh, I won the world title, mm -hmm. the IBA world title, and I got called to the um, council house in, in Nottingham, mm -hmm. and they and they invited about two hundred or two hundred fifty guests. So I had all my family, my friends, the Lord Mayor, mm -hmm. the councillors, and uh, and we had dinner. We had dinner there, then they took wow. pictures there, and then they presented me with the key of Nottingham. And uh, still to this day, don't really know what it means. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think, uh, yeah, you can get said to privileges, but I never mm -hmm. really used it much, to be honest. Um, <laughs> But it was really good, and and it's always nice to be recognised and uh, for your achievements and for something that you you love or you're passionate about. You know, it's just a, it's just a, a bonus. Mm. And then on top of that, talking about accolades as well, you had an MBE 
from the late uh, yeah, Queen yeah. Elizabeth II. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was that? Because that, obviously that, that's, that was, that's that was outside a, of Nottingham. That now. was another shock, you know, again, doing something that you love. My manager, Tommy Gilmore, he said, um, well, I, I got I got a letter, a big letter, and I was like, what's this? It's someone to do with the palace. And I said, somebody's taking the mickey. And I goes, and I rang, and I thought, you know what? I just checked with my manager and I rang him up and I said, do you know anything about this? And he goes, well, you got a letter? He goes, I've been trying for years. I've not got it, you know. <laughs> he goes, we put your name forward. Somebody else put your name forward. Um, and and you've been uh, you've been called for your services to boxing mm. and for your community and charity work. You know, I've done a bit of charity work, uh, work in the community around that time. Mm-hmm. This was about 2004 when I was close to the end of, you know. So I'd, mm-hmm. I represented England um, in South Africa and, uh, and defended my belt there. Mm. A lot of uh, Englishmen haven't done that. Um, so... I think Lennis Lewis lost in the same uh, arena that I won in. Oh, so, really? Yeah, Carnival City. Uh, to ask me, Hasim Rahman. Um, ah, so that okay, was yeah. uh, that was a, a big thing. But yeah, I got that, and I thought, my God, you know, I'm really going to the palace. Uh, uh, I was quite shocked, but yeah, me, my dad, mum, my sister went, and um, we had a really nice time, and uh, got a few photos and a little video to to remember it. Of by. course, so it's, yeah. it was amazing. Yeah, it was. Uh, what was that like for you, though? Because obviously, you know. As we talked about at the beginning, you didn't know where boxing was going to go. You didn't know if you were going to go professional, yeah, let alone yeah, obviously yeah, then yeah. win a title, let alone obviously defend the title X number of times that most people yeah. don't even do, to then obviously getting the key to Nottingham, to then yeah. having MBE with the Queen. It's it's a bit crazy. Sometimes I have to pinch myself and think, you know, did all this really happen? Mm. I didn't make the millions, but I had a really good career. Mm. Um, you know, I travelled the world, went to different countries, Met a lot of different people. Met Mike Tyson. Met mm. other boxers. Met the Queen, um, and and still get recognised. Had all these uh, um, awards and stuff. Went on on TV and everything. And I thought, you know, there was a stage when I was just doing boxing for the for the fun of it, and mm. never, like you said, never really thought I was going to achieve as much. Um, when I think about it, you know, money and the rest of it could never buy that kind of happiness that I've got through. The achievements that I, I did mm. you know yes for a little while you get the materialistic things but um now I've got good memories and um and achievements and and, and they're gonna stay with me forever that's it and not just after you're gone as well your name will always be tied to the lineage of obviously the titles the MBE so like but, no yeah. one now people can't get an MBE yeah, from even, Queen Elizabeth it's even now it's um you know my family my kids everybody are proud everywhere they go they get recognized being the the, the kids of of, of Jared Kalik or the go, father yeah. of Jared Kalik. So, you know, that makes me proud to see them being proud of, Definitely. of me. Definitely. And, uh, and, and yeah, it's just, uh, it's just amazing. And it's, un- you know, it's unbelievable that all this happened. And, and, and the best thing is that I'm still involved. Yeah. I'm still involved and, and, and we're planning other things that are mm-hmm. um, not just boxing related. It's other things. And, and we're passing on experience and I'm seeing the generation, the next generation do well. I'm seeing um, my good work helping the next generation. And that in itself is a different kind of achievement. Mm-hmm. And, and it gives me a different kind of um, happiness mm-hmm. um, to box and even more so. Mm-hmm. Um, because because, because, because I, I don't only get it through because of the boxing. It's just how they, how the parents and are happy with their kids and how yeah. I see the change in them. I've seen kids from um, 10 years ago that were doing nothing, that were getting into trouble. Mm-hmm. And now they come to me and say, uncle, <laughs> that's what they call me now, yeah. uncle. <laughs> and they go, uncle, if it wasn't for you, I would have never gone to university. Uncle, if it was never you, I would have never done this. I would have mm-hmm. been in prison. I would have messed about. I was not. I was you know, on a bad route. I had some come back yesterday and the day before. After two, uh, two, three, four years, that we're getting into some bad, bad habits. He's at university as well now, mm. and 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 it's just, it's just. Um, it all comes down word, to legacy, word, doesn't it? Word, words can't, words can't. I can't. I can't. I ain't got the right words for that. You know, it's just yeah. kind of crazy. But yeah, I can't even describe how that feels. How that makes me feel. Definitely. Um, but it's 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 amazing and uh, and humbling sometimes. Yeah. No, hundred um, percent. And uh, I'm just happy that I'm in that kind of position that I can do what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And I think it's down to obviously as you put a focus on in your career to be more defensive, not take as much punishment, and you've always looked after yourself, even after boxing, as we've seen like with Ricky Hatton, for example, and um, you know, a lot of other boxers when they retire, even any sort of uh, professional uh, sports star, 
when they retire, obviously they just stop entirely. Yeah, yeah. And they put on a lot of weight. Luckily, Ricky Hatton has uh, obviously shifted that weight off now. But um, yeah, what was that desire to keep that? Was it literally just your nature? You just who you I think, were? I think it was. Yeah, I think it was just uh, how I how I was, mm -hmm. and I was lucky to get back into the boxing coaching mm. and started training with some of the kids. Try to keep up with them again. That competitiveness in me, and uh, and I'm 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 pretty lucky that I've I've got a, a reasonable metabolism, even though I'm still eating all that crap <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> uh, but I met Ricky a couple of years ago at an event, and he goes. And we sparred together a few times. Oh, wow. Back in the day, we got pictures up in the gym still. Mm. And he was a slim little young lad there. And he goes, look at you, Jav, you're bloody the same. Look at me and you. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just funny. And I, was, and, I look, and, I, and I used to always say, I don't want to be one of them people as well. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. be one of them. I want to keep myself in reasonable shape, keep mm -hmm. myself in uh, uh, good shape and stuff. And uh, a few months ago, a few months ago, my sister passed away with cancer. Sorry to hear And uh, a, lot, a lot of my friends know this. And... Uh, me and my brother are running the London Marathon mm -hmm. for cancer to help, help in any way that we can raise some money, help to for them to sort of try to combat this disease, this terrible disease that a lot of families struggle with. Mm -hmm. um, so I've just started preparing for that. Mm -hmm. That's helped me get back into even better shape, and um, you know I've actually got I can see my six pack coming back after yeah. tw after twenty years. So um, yeah, it's um, I think I think you need something. To focus on a bit of a challenge, a bit of something, um, something to Some form of motivate you. Yeah. yeah, and I think this has started motivating me. Even though I've got a few injuries with my knees and other things, mm. it's it's motivated me again. It's got me going again a little bit, and uh, and I'm, I'm I'm doing pretty well. So um, I will have a page up soon for the fundraiser. If anybody would like to, I'll put it in the description. Um, yeah. That would be amazing. Um, <laughs> hopefully today or tomorrow I'll be have that fundraiser up. Mm -hmm. um, I was just leaving it to the last minute because I didn't want to prepare for it, get the funds and not be able to do it because of my knees or something. But of course, I've, I've yeah. realised I can hopefully get through this now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. No, definitely. We'll have that. We'll have that for sure. And, you know, we touched earlier about the the changes in the boxing scene, how back in when you were boxing, there wasn't like, you know, your strength and, you know, all these separate departments, mm -hmm. if you will, you know, and, and what do you think to that though? What do you think to this, this new age of boxing where you have... I think, I think all of that is good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it makes it easy for the boxers to prepare. Mm -hmm. It makes them the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think some people are still doing things wrong, um, where they will try to lose too much weight and be too big and strong, and it can cause problems. Yeah. And that's what we had, used to have before, too many injuries and too many problems because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, um, like everything in, in life, things evolve and they get better. And this is a way of boxers getting better. Yeah. And you can, you can see that. There's a lot of boxers that are doing things that we wasn't doing 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. people weren't doing 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. So everybody gets better, and I think it only helps improve things yeah. um, uh, and make it better. So it's probably a good thing. I wish I had it when I was boxing. You know, <laughs> They would have taken your food away I, from I, you. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I would have, I would have um, probably achieved a lot more. Mm. And in terms of like the, the boxing scene now, obviously we have the, as we said, the boxing politics is probably as strong as ever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously the money in boxing has grown massively. But then now we have the social media boxing, the YouTube boxing. And uh, what are your thoughts to that? When you first saw that, what were your thoughts? When I th first thought, saw that, I think I was a bit like some of the old school boxers. Mm. I was thinking, no, how can they get an easy ride? How can they get to where they got without even having the hardships and the hard fights and proving themselves? Mm. They're making millions um, doing nothing. Mm. Just getting a few a few training sessions, jumping in, having a little fight, a four round or a six round or whatever they're doing. Yeah. And here we are killing ourselves for 10, 15 years. Mm not even achieving uh, or making half as much as what they're making. Yeah. Um, and, it, and, it, and I think and I think in anything, people get a bit jealous or a bit uh, envious. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and But realistically, when I think when I look at it, and after, after seeing a few of them, I started thinking, you know what? It's helping boxing. Yeah. It's helping attract more people in boxing. It's helping grow boxing, something that I love and I've been involved in 30-odd years. Yeah. So is it a bad thing? No. As long as they don't um, get hurt, go for a box uh, matches that might not be their level. Mm. Keep it as they are. I think I think it's it's not a bad thing. I think more people need to get involved. Mm. You know, if anything, I need to get involved. <laughs> if anybody's out there, give me a call. That's it. <laughs> I can make a comeback for one of the YouTubers. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Oh, well, like I said, I spotted you uh, not not long ago. Well, 
uh, I sparred you and you dropped me already. So, you know, these guys wouldn't stand a chance, but it'd be incredible. But it's good to hear, you know, it's good to hear. And I think, as you said, I was similar in the beginning. I was like, ah, oh. I, I thought, yeah, it's just a box, yeah, like a YouTube thing. I thought it was like a one, one off, two off thing. But then obviously now it's becoming quite a consistent thing. Yeah. And uh, it's definitely, you know, I think it's very interesting because I think it allows for people kind of, it, it opens that door to what we were talking about earlier, yeah. where people obviously look at social media and fighting and think, oh yeah, I can just do this. Um, but I feel like the way they are taking it, if you want to do it at a good level, then you will still have to put some level of work in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise you're going to turn into a, a highlight reel or yeah, a knockout think, or something. I think, I think I think in everything, there's some people that are going to be not very good, mm. going to be terrible, make this make make people talk bad about it. Yeah. But then there's the ones that are half decent mm -hmm. that, that can do, you know, do something and maybe become real boxers and, Definitely. and do it quite well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you don't have to look at all the the worst ones, look at the ones that are doing quite well as well. But it's an opportunity and I think um, if, if people that are, are saying bad things about it are only jealous mm. because they can't get the chances, they haven't got opportunities mm -hmm. or whatever it is, you know, and I, I understand that, you know, um, it's just human nature to be a little bit envious because somebody's got an easier route than you have or, yeah. or vice versa or whatever, mm -hmm. but I think, um, you know, everybody has their time and, Definitely. and, and be happy for them or or, 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 or support, support in whatever way, you know, there's no point in, in being jealous if you can't get something and, and, and if you had a bad time or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't get the best best run at the end, but mm -hmm. you know, I think if you hold it inside of your grudge, mm. anything, I think it just burns you up and, uh, and, can be, and can be bad for you. Was there a period where you did feel a certain kind of way? Maybe oh, yes. shortly after? Oh, yes, yes. Um, for quite a while, um, after I retired, I was like, I gotta make a comeback, you know. I can't leave it like this. Mm. I was, I, I was on, I was on the verge of getting a big money fight, mm -hmm. and and it's not just about the money, but it is near the end because you've put all your life into boxing. Yeah, you want something for your kids. You start thinking about the future. At the beginning, it's all about achieving. Yeah, you want to achieve. You want to be the best. You want to be number one. You want to mm -hmm. win world titles. Afterwards, you think, wait a minute, world titles aren't gonna feed me. World titles aren't gonna feed my kids or give me a life for mm -hmm. the future. I need something for the future. And that's when you start thinking, yeah, I need a bit of money, or I need, I need, I need to cover my expenses for what I've mm -hmm. put my life in, giving all the entertainment for the people. People don't understand yeah. how much you give to to entertain people, of course, to, to show what you know, uh, to make people happy in a sense. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, there was a time when I was um, a little envious, and I thinking, you know, um, I didn't make nothing uh, uh, like I should have. And then I look at the people that are below me mm -hmm. and got used and abused maybe were better fighters than me, but never had that chance or that breakthrough fight where I got them breakthrough fights. Yeah. I can say I made it myself or whatever. No, it was written in some way or, you know, there was some sort of God-given help or talent or whatever it is. Mm. Um, and then and, and you've got to be happy and content with what you've achieved and what you've made. And that's what was meant for me. And, uh, and if I'm happy and content with that, that will make me a happier person. And hopefully, inshallah, in the, in the future, you know, things will will get better and they have. So, you yeah. Know, um, yeah, I think um, everyone's different and some people would never never get away from that and always be jealous or envious. And, mm, they stay in that, yeah, that and mindset, yeah. And that mindset, and it's that mindset you've got to change. If you don't, mm. then it can just hurt, hurt. Do you, do you think seeing your impact in the coaching side of things might have helped to sort of shift that mindset? Oh, definitely. Mm. I think um, staying involved in the sport mm -hmm. has given me an outlet has kept me involved in boxing, not made me want to, even though I wanted to have a few comebacks back in the day, mm -hmm. um, I think it's made it more realistic. Like, you know, um, I think whenever you retire and you get older, you've got to be realistic in yourself and listen to your family and people around you that are good, mm -hmm. that have your best interest and tell you, look, nobody likes to hear you're probably not as good as you was. Yeah, It's probably time to retire. Mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, you weren't able to beat these guys or be as good as you was. Um, um, but if you've got the right people, it helps. And uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, you know, you've got to find the right time for everything. Definitely. And in terms of the coaching, what's your goal? Is it obviously, I know that you've talked about the, the work that you're going to be doing and continuing the impact on the community, etc. But in terms of boxing side of things, have you ever wanted to have sort of, you know, get a champion or put, yeah. I know you've had an amateur and uh, also, you know, regional champions. Yeah, yeah. But have you ever wanted to get like a champion? I think, I think, to, I think to start with, like we said, uh, the coaching helped me. Um, I gave that release, let, you know, let me forget about, not forget about competing myself or, mm -hmm. or, or, or not be so uh, upset about not getting what I, what I thought I was deserved or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. 
And then now it's like more about the kids. Yeah. It's more about the kids giving them the opportunities I never got. Mm-hmm. Giving get helping them with the with the with the problems I had and not you know, letting them have the same sort of problems. Mm-hmm. And then it was then then I started thinking, you know, we need some champions and we got the regional champions, we got the East Midlands champions. Mm-hmm. Then you start you want to, you want internationals or you want some of the someone to go pro later on. Mm-hmm. And and yes, that's the next step that we wanna we want to carry on building as many champions, building the name, mm-hmm. uh, and then possibly get somebody uh, turning professional. Uh-huh. Um, um, I was, I used to think about it before, but because my kids were younger, I had a lot more the responsibilities. Yeah. I couldn't give that them time. That takes a lot of traveling. It like, takes a lot of time up, yeah. And I know, I know how much time it takes to of course. help a professional boxer. Mm-hmm. How much time you got to give your life almost to that person. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a lot, and I don't want to. Not be able to give them the time they need, they did, they need and deserve. Because mm-hmm. I never got it when I was there, and I know how bad it is, and I don't want to do that to somebody else. Yeah. So I want to wait for the right time. So another few years, and then maybe get my professional license, and then take it to the next level. Yeah, hopefully. Definitely. Uh, and in the future, yeah, I would love to. I think all trainers uh, would love to have a world champion, a um, British champion, or any kind of champion. You know. Definitely. Um, but a world champion is the the ultimate goal and. I think that's what you got to look for. You got to look for that as the, as the mark. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. And you know we're wrapping up towards the end now. And what I like to do at the end is the uh, sort of quick fire questions. Okay. And I know we've talked about your role models already in terms of boxing, but one question I've been asking every guest so far since I started doing this is, uh, if you could meet anyone from the past, you know, or or present, but like any time in the past, uh, just meet them for whatever reason, uh, who would it be? I think I'm going to. I think Muhammad Ali. Mm. I think Muhammad Ali. You have to. You have to say, yeah, he's one of the greatest, and not just because of the boxing, because of the person he was mm. and, and what he went through. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I'd love to meet him. Definitely, definitely. And I think everyone already knows why. You <laughs> know, everyone already knows why. Uh, such an incredible human being, and as you say, such a huge impact outside the the boxing as well, um, which obviously you're emulating too and continue to do so. In terms of, you know, your advice for people who say, struggle with confidence, what would your advice to them be? I think um, if you're struggling with confidence, you've got to learn to, it's hard, again, you can easily say, believe in yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you believe in yourself? Yeah, you, ha- you have to go and do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Take that step forward, go to a, a gym, go to a place that you are passionate about something or or talk to somebody that can help you in that way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and maybe they can help you build that confidence. See somebody that's done what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's never going to be easy. There's no easy way of saying, oh, I'll do this and you'll get the confidence. I think confidence comes with time and experience. Mm-hmm. So whatever you uh, are passionate about, whatever you want to do in life, um, get some help, get some, uh, you know, go and see people or see somebody that you can mm-hmm. help you maybe in that way. Uh, I think that's probably the best way or, or, or a role model of some, that you, you know, somebody you look up to. Mm-hmm. Get some words of advice from them. Definitely. Definitely. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Or even really- better, the parents. Oh yeah, they have always got your best interests. A lot of people, we we you know I'm probably bad for it as well. We we don't listen to our parents because we get upset with them. Yeah, um, and it's very easy to do that. I think um, we have to always remember one thing: the parents are always there with the best interest, mm. and they only say things to you if you're doing things wrong or if they want to better you and help you in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so um, that's probably the first person to go to. Yeah, and then others. Definitely. No, and like I said, it's an absolute pleasure to to have you with us today. It's been uh, written in my notebook from, uh, I don't even know, like six, seven years ago. And uh, I know we're going to get to some training talk after this, but I'm going to have your descriptions below, any any that you want there, your socials and the fundraising. That will all be in the description below. Thank you for tuning in once again. Make sure you leave a comment below with what your biggest takeaway from the episode was and the journey of Javed to Sleek to Kalik. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming down. Thank you for having me.